So uh, typically, people start these things by introducing themselves. So here goes. My name is Asande. I'm a first year medical student, but I'm studying medicine with the intention of becoming everything but a doctor. Let me explain. Earlier this year, when I was conversing with someone who runs medical trials in the KZN province, it was conveyed to me that she was doing research on the neurocognitive effects of HIV. So she collected the data, the neurocognitive patterns of HIV positive people, but when she went to the database to get the control data, so the neurocognitive patterns of HIV negative people, she was shocked to find that this data was defined for Western developed countries, but didn't exist for a single African country. We lack so much research that we can't even define our own normal. This is compounded by another issue. When we see people like Elon Musk or Mark Shuttleworth, people that stand at the edges of the world, we seem to have this tendency to be like, oh, they're from South Africa, you know. Elon is from Pretoria. Mark Shuttleworth is from Cape Town. But we do this because as a continent, we're trying to shield our own insecurities. We're trying to say, we can also create. We can also own knowledge. We can carve people of intellectual prowess. We are also levelers of the world. But where are all the rest? And now we stand at a precipice. We have countries that have gone as far as creating the knowledge that was necessary to conquer the vacuum outside of our existence, space. But when last did a child within the borders of this continent pick up a plane, feel the need to conquer the sky, and know that the wings on which his dreams rest were given to him by none other than his forefathers? The wings on which the dreams of the children of Africa rest have a name research. So I know that this word is associated less with the development of African countries than it is with this really weird thing that people do at university when they get like a PhD and then like maybe they'll win a Nobel Prize for it, but then it kind of ends there. But I think in making that association, we do a bit of damage to ourselves. We're living in a new era. Research is now a currency. And I don't mean it in like an abstract way. It's something of observable value that can buy us other things of observable value. But even if you strip away the economic meaning of like value, there's no greater power than knowing as a society that you own ideas, that you own knowledge, and that you don't need to use somebody else's definition to qualify yourselves. But for us to get to this point, we need to invest in research. I believe that this continent could be aberrations in people's worst hopes for us. Where we were once wounds of damage, we could become scars of healing. We have a turbulent past. It's well known that there are various points in time where we were told that we don't own ourselves. But for us to reverse the psychology, we need to, going to have to convince ourselves that we can create global solutions. There's a unique psychosocial edge that comes with community being able to put their name behind an invention. This filters beyond the periphery of a child's imagination. Stanford professor Francis Fukuyama hypothesizes that feelings of national unity actually contribute to economic development. So imagine if we could unite our entire continent behind the idea that we are creators of knowledge, that we own global solutions, we could spur ourselves into a new economic era. But most importantly, for us to finally create a vision of the future that we own, and for us to suction that vision from higher dimensions to the one of our present, we're going to have to pay some serious attention to research. And this is where we get to the crux of the matter. So research is a means of economic empowerment in various ways. The first is the whole national unity that I've just referred to. But the second is one that you might be more familiar with when people do some research, file a patent, and start a technological company. But for all its benefits, we seem to undertake this course of action way less than other societies do. 
The World Economic Property Indicators of 2017 indicates that 3.17 million patents were filed that year. Of that 3.17 million, 1.8 million were filed by the People's Republic of China, 600,000 by the United States, and only 15,580 by the entire African continent. Despite having four times as many mines in the United States, we only account for 0.5% of the world's global research. And we need to understand why that is. So the first barrier I'm going to discuss are what we think economic empowerment actually means. I think that we've given ourselves and our youth a false sense of what economic empowerment truly is. We tell them to go to university, to get a degree, to get a job, and we essentially tell them to find visions of comfort not in creating things, but in just having a job. I think there are very few of us in this room who are fortunate enough to be in circles where we were encouraged to do different. And I think the only scientists our parents ever envisioned us becoming were actuarial scientists. <laughs> I don't say that to indicate that we should all be getting PhDs, but I say that to indicate that we need to change the way we think. We're living in a new industrial era. It's one in which we're not just gonna get jobs off of degrees. We're being replaced by machines, not just in a mechanical sense, but in a reasoning sense. So perhaps the only place that we're gonna come in as a job market is where we create the knowledge that these machines use to reason. So when I say this, I mean to indicate that 20 or 30 years from now, it could become very normal for people to be doing research on a daily basis, feeding it into a machine, and then the machine starts making do new diagnostics. But if we don't invest in research as a course of action on this continent, we're going to find ourselves being left behind once again. The second barrier that we have placed on ourselves are the visions that we have of ourselves. I think when I stand here and I compare statistics like with China and with the United States, it seems a little unfair that I'm comparing statistics from developed nations that have unemployment rates as low as 3.8% to a continent where its biggest economy has unemployment rates of 30%. It even seems unfair that a continent that first needs to solidify the presence of food in everyone's mouth and the absence from wars on its soils should somehow be like finding funds to create mathematical equations and stuff. But I maintain that this is the way out. This is the way that we remove the shadows that have been cast on us. Research is a means of benefaction. And when I say that, I mean to say that we as a continent are trapped in a way of thinking. I think we still define currency as selling raw materials, not currency as in finished, selling finished goods. And for us to start defining currency as in selling finished goods, we need to find ways to polish, manufacture, and create our own finished goods. And if you look at the economic makeup of most developed societies, they seem to be getting most of their GDP, or gross domestic product, from the secondary and tertiary sectors, which are fairly research intensive. So if we want to propel ourselves into a new state of economic development, we're going to need to invest more in research. But I still have this feeling that it's tempting to be like, oh, but you can't expect African governments to do it alone. But it doesn't have to be an extreme investment. When I say investing in research, I don't mean just like giving academia millions of dollars and saying, okay, go fix these problems, make us a product and start us a couple of companies. When I say it, I mean it starts small. Recently, in this most recent holiday, I read a book. And it described how Jeff Bezos came to be the owner of one of the world's biggest tech companies, Amazon. What you find is that he was raised and educated in a very particular way. He entered science fairs and competed with children that were older than him. He designed mathematical equations to quantify the effectiveness of each of his teachers. And at school, they did math and algebra, but they had a session every single morning dedicated to reading stories and extracting valuable lessons from them. So when I say investing in research, I mean infecting children with the want to dream and the want to create. It's as simple as investing in a couple of science fairs and encouraging children to show off how their solar panel works 
whether it works or it doesn't, or to show off for new material that they think they discovered, whether they have or they haven't. I'm sure many of us went to go watch Black Panther. We sat with our friends in the cinema, and for two hours we delighted in the thought that the reason why the world doesn't know about African global knowledge is because we choose to hide it. We delighted in the thought that under the carpets of our poverty, we chose to hide our technology because it was too great for the world to see it. But the moment you step out of the theater, you realize that it's not true. The world doesn't know about African knowledge because we haven't carved the spaces for it to exist. So when I stepped out here today, I did it with a bit of a contradiction. I said that I was studying medicine to be everything but a doctor. So if I have to tell you my plans, I want to be involved in nanomedical engineering, although my degree is very long and I'm kind of scared that's gonna change along the way. And the reason why I don't want to be a clinician is because we do need a lot of those in the country and we do have shortages. But if I became a clinician, I wouldn't be becoming the kind of person that we need to solve our problems. If I want to tell the government to invest in research, that I need to find a way to make myself the type of person that shows them exactly what research can do. So in 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. stood in front of a crowd and said, we are going to cash a check. When he said that, he meant to say that they were no longer going to live in a state of poverty of liberation. So in 2019, when I stand before you and I say, that we are going to cash a check. I mean to say that I don't want to watch us get swallowed into a poverty of intellectual property. So I dream of a future where, just for once in modern history, we stand on the front pages as the cures of cancer or the makers of a car. I dream of a future where we own each and every fabric of it. And most importantly, I dream of a future where we ride our own hot thermal up and out of this world. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Yeah. <laughs>